So, um, well, I would now like, um, well, to announce our keynote, uh, which will be held by Matthew Griffin, who is founder of 311 Institute and World uh, Futures Forum. So he will give us his presentation on the future of trade and shipping. So please welcome with me, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you. I did both my ankles in about five weeks ago when I caught my daughter falling down the stairs. So that's why I'm hobbling. That's it. Nothing to do basically with the huge airport queues. Uh, so, yeah, th so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my first outing this year. That's it because I've been doing a lot of my presentations virtually uh, as a testament to uh, the digital world that we now live in. Um, so my name's Matthew Griffin. Uh, I'm a futurist but also strategic advisor. Uh, I work with the vast majority of the world's multinationals. I work with all G20 governments, prime ministers, presidents, as well as ministers. I work with the United Nations where when we actually have a look at trying to solve all United Nations SDG 1 through 16. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting today on the future of trade and shipping. But what I want to try to do is I want to try and show you some things that you hadn't necessarily considered. So my point of view is 50 years. And I cross over 450 exponential technologies. You can take these technologies, when you combine them together, you transform every single part of global business, culture, and society. So over here, we have advanced manufacturing, and a lot of these will actually impact shipping and trade, especially shipping. But we have compute, we have new connectivity technologies, new energy technologies, we'll talk about that, robotics, uh, new user interfaces and user experiences and all kinds of things. But when we actually have a look at trying to drive sustainability, say, for example, reducing or decarbonizing the shipping industry, there are a couple of technologies that you probably haven't really thought of. So the first one I'm going to talk about is what I call exponential innovation with an AI in it. Now, when we have a look at ships, uh, typically a 8,000 uh, 8, TEU ship at 24 knots basically will consume 225 tons of bunker fuel. Now, that's about $3.5 million per 28-day journey. So for a standard ship, that's a huge amount of fuel. It's also a huge amount of pollution. Now, one of the things that drives ship efficiency is the weight of ships. The lighter the ships, the less fuel they use, outside of anything else. But today, we already have artificial intelligences. We call them creative machines that are receiving patents. Now, the significance of an artificial intelligence that can design a product, iterate and innovate a product, and then something that we can then 3D print off is significant, particularly when we start having a look at weight. Because the shipping industry actually has a lot in common with a lot of other industries. One of the other industries that cares about weight or the weight of vehicles and things is the space industry. So we used, at NASA, we used a creative machine to shave 30% off of the weight of lunar rovers. So the way that this was done is we took a wireframe model, put it into a computer, and the artificial intelligence ran tens of thousands of simulations every minute to try to figure out what was the most optimal way to design a lunar rover with the least amount of materials. Now, JPL, when we first started this particular program, they said, we're not going to be interested in anything that you have to say if you can't shave 10% off of the weight of our lunar vehicles. And I said, and frankly, basically, we've got PhDs at JPL who have been looking at these issues for decades, and they can move the bar by about 3%. So frankly, go away because we think you're wasting our time. So in association with organizations like Autodesk, two weeks later, basically went back into NASA and said, we think we might have something. And they said, well, have you moved the dial? Have you actually achieved a 10% saving, weight saving on our vessels? And we said, no, we made them 30% lighter. This is the standard way that NASA now design all of their vehicles. And 
not only are these particular vehicles lighter, they're 120% stronger. Now, I know what you're thinking. Cargo ships and lunar, lunar rovers basically don't really have that much in common. However, we are using these technologies basically through the car industry. We are using these in, we are using these in the aviation industry with Airbus. Airbus are actually using creative machines to design the A330neo, which is a lot lighter than its predecessors. In addition to that, these creative machines, basically from a shipping perspective, are already designing new steels and aluminiums. So when you have a look at aluminium 3000 or aluminium 7000 or high performance steels, they're already designing new alloys. And then in addition to that, when you start combining some of these new steels and manufacturing processes with hydrogen, as we've seen literally recently in Sweden, we now have the world's first green zero carbon emission steel, which is now being used by Volvo. So when we start thinking about how we actually build cargo ships and put them together, we have green steel, we have new alloys, but we have ways to actually make them lighter than ever before. Now, when we have a look at creative machines, they can, turn, they can make a lighter cargo ship or components for a cargo ship. It doesn't have to be the entire ship. You could just make you know, liquid natural gas uh, containers that are about 30% lighter as well. But really, to get some of the advantages, the weight advantages, you need to 3D print them. So when we start having a look at advanced manufacturing technologies, this is the world's largest 3D printed ship. It's not particularly big at the minute. However, three years ago, we couldn't actually 3D print a boat or a ship. And this is the printer. There we go. So increasingly, we're seeing advances in robotics. And when we talk about 3D printing, we have something called 3D swarm robotics, which are now letting us print 3D government offices. So when I say offices, we're talking about buildings and everything else. The robots combine, they collaborate, basically, and all of a sudden, we're printing much, much bigger structures. Now, it's going to take a while, basically, before you can actually 3D print a cargo ship. Boeing want to 3D print a 737, uh, for example, and it'll be using kind of these types of technologies and everything else. But this is a sort of view of the future. Now, in addition to that, one of, these, uh, one of the other things that these creative machines are really, really good at doing is they are good at fundamentally looking at how different products are built. So if you imagine a ship's engine, I mean, what are they, a couple of thousand tons? Put that into a creative machine. All of a sudden, you have a way, and we've done this already with, with rockets, this is relativity space, where we've managed to design ro rockets with 90% fewer components that are 30% lighter, etc., etc., etc. In this case, this is the relativity Terran R, it takes 60 days to print. And what does this ultimately mean for shipping? Faster ship recycling, new alloys, lighter ships, fewer components, all that kind of stuff. So when we're actually having a look at ship break ridges, faster ship recycling. And these technologies are here today. They're just being applied in different industries. Now, when we have a look at decarbonizing the industry, Generally, we think that the cost of, of greening the global shipping fleet is going to be in the region of $235 billion by 2026, bearing in mind that, on average, the life expectancy of a cargo ship has moved from about 20 years to about 26 years over the past seven to eight years. Um, and retrofitting is about $114 billion by 2026, because if you want to hit the emission targets by 2050, so 70% global greenhouse gas, em gas emission reductions by 2050, you need to start ordering your ships now, which really means that we're dealing with technologies now to try to build ships that will be fit for the future. And when you have a look at retrofitting a 24,000 TEU vessel with, say, liquid natural gas, it's about $25 million, so it's not exactly cheap. Um, which is also why we're seeing a lot of extra scrappage recently. Now, when we talk about different energy technologies, ditching bunker fuel, we have a whole variety of new technologies coming through, as well as energy technologies. And in fact, of all of the different sectors that I track, the energy sector is by far the most innovative sector of all. Now, it's a huge space just in itself, so I'm going to cherry pick 
Um, so today we have fossil fuels. Now, when we have a look at electric cargo ships, they use lithium-ion batteries. If I use 3D printing to 3D print a lithium-ion battery, I have a battery that is 400% more energy dense than anything that we have today. And we've done that. When we have a look at polymers, we have polymers now that will recharge basically within a minute. So if you have an electric cargo ship like the Yara Birkeland, it can take a very long time to charge. So we can either charge it wirelessly, using technologies like we see from MCOR that allow long distance wireless energy charging, or we can use polymer batteries, et cetera, et cetera. When we have a look at things like uh, photovoltaics, today if you put photovoltaics on a cargo ship or any ship, it's about 17 to 20% energy efficient. I can show you prototypes in the labs of solar panels and solar concentrators that are 48, 80, and 132% energy efficient. So when we think about solar not necessarily being part of the energy mix for shipping in the future, thanks to nanophotonic materials, we can generate electricity from amb ambient light when it's cloudy, from rain, from all kinds of different things. But that's a little bit of a different story. Now, throwing these into the mix, if you're the Russian military, the Chinese military, or the American military, you love super cavitation. Because supercavitation generates streams of bubbles, basically, from the front of the vessel. Supercavitation puts things like submarines into an air bubble. You reduce drag. Using supercavitation, and we're doing this in the military, we are able, it looks like we are able to create submarines that are supersonic. And if you think that's crazy, go and have a look. So supercavitation, I'm just throwing this in as a complete wild card because you can actually retrofit supercavitation onto uh, cargo ships to reduce drag. However, moving to slightly more practical things, omniphobic, omniphobic coatings, easy for me to say. So the US military have created an omniphobic coating that saves over 50% of fuel at low speed and 80% of fuel at high speed, where high speed is around that sort of 20 knot speed. Uh, now, it's secret at the moment, but again, when you have a look at material science, emerging technologies, bearing in mind that artificial intelligence is getting very good at material science and all these kinds of things, think what a true omniphobic coating would do for the hull of a ship. And that exists, by the way. The military just aren't sharing it. Uh, in addition to that, basically, we have technologies from companies like... Uh, Philips, um, as well as others, um, if you put sails on a ship, you can save fuel. You can save about 20% fuel. Um, that's fine. What about creating unlimited amounts of carbon neutral fuel courtesy of MIT? So, what if your cargo ship can suck in seawater? Because I think there's plenty of seawater in the sea. It can then use catal catalysts to create hydrocarbons. That's diesel and bunker fuel from seawater, and it's carbon neutral. In addition to that, some of the things we already see, ammonia, but if you actually convert every ship, or if you convert 30% of ships to ammonia, the big problem that you have converting at cargo ships or, or a lot of the fleet to ammonia is we're going to have to double global ammonia production which is a challenge in itself. You've got a scaled, scalability problem, basically, with ammonia. Um, now, when we have a look at biofuels, again, throwing some wild cards in there. On the one hand, we can use genetic engineering technologies like CRISPR to create biofuels that are incredibly energy dense. However, if you use something like a kelp elevator, and these are actually in the, uh, in the Pacific at the moment, you have four times the biofuel yield that you do of crops on land. When we have a look at hydrogen, we have, we've got lots of different types of hydrogen. Um, typically, there's now about $30 billion worth of hydrogen plants being implemented around the world, so particularly in the Middle East, uh, as well as parts of Europe and the US. So hydrogen, when you have a look at gray hydrogen, which is hydrogen that's produced from coal, it's about $1.2 per kilo. Uh, when we have a look at blue hydrogen, which is the common one now, basically that's about 90 cents. And then when you have a look at green, it's $3 per cent, or $3 per kilo. Now, 
Green hydrogen is hydrogen that is generated from completely renewable energy sources. It's kind of the global gold standard of hydrogen. But at $3 a kilo, it's too expensive. But when you have a look at technologies, technologies always start really expensive, and then they come down. So think about communication. How much does it cost you now to speak to anyone in Australia? Yeah. And when we actually have a look at uh, converting the fleet to hydrogen, 57% of all trans-Pacific voyages would have to give up about 5% of cargo space. Now, again, you can solve that by when we have a look at sort of fuel, different fuel cell technologies and designs and everything else. But giving up 5% of your cargo space, yeah, no one likes giving up space. Uh, methanol, so again, one of the problems that you share basically with the rocket industry basically is the rocket industry is always being slated as being highly polluting. When you have a look at the latest SpaceX SN18 rocket, which is the big Falcon Heavy, everyone says it's a huge polluter. And so when Elon Musk is actually sitting down on stages, everyone goes, you talk about being a green and sustainable and responsible entrepreneur, but you're producing rockets that burn huge amounts of carbon positive fuel. And he comes back and says, no, because you're using methanol. So again, using catalysts, we suck different components basically out of the air. We generate methanol. It's carbon, it's carbon neutral. It hits the UN SDGs. Uh, when we have a look at optimal routing, we've got quantum computers coming through. So quantum computers are 100 million times more powerful than anything that you have anywhere in your company uh, or in your server or data farms. Quantum computers basically will help you optimize ship routes like never before. So you could pick the most energy efficient route in real time based on local weather conditions, local sea conditions, currents and all sorts of things. When we have a look at ship operations, yeah, everything's changing. Um, courtesy of organizations like Starlink, OneWeb, and others, I can push over one terabyte, terabit of aggregated bandwidth, upload and download, to any ship anywhere on the planet. This is now a global system, and it went global basically in September. So I can do it at 20 milliseconds as well. 20 milliseconds is relevant for a couple of reasons. And I can do it really cheaply. So all of a sudden, you now have a way to connect your ships like you never could before, much lower cost, much faster speed. Now, when we start having a look at autonomous ships, um, generally the return on investment for autonomous ships doesn't actually add up yet. However, when you talk to Rolls-Royce, Rolls-Royce generally think that autonomous ships will be able to save about 30% of the operating costs of vessels, mainly because you're getting rid of people um, and there are other sort of savings that you can get. However, on the one hand, fully autonomous ships or even partially autonomous ships are going to help operators save money. But on the other hand, they're going to actually increase the amount of money that you have to spend somewhere else. Because on the one hand, you can use telematics from a fully autonomous ship, bearing in mind that when you have a look at most ship claims, it's human error and it's fires. Most of the multi-billion dollar claims that go through Lloyd's, for example, basically are human error and fire. Um, with telematics, basically something that we're already seeing in other industries, you can use this to self-insure. So one of the reasons why the UAE actually became, came to prominence was that in the 1970s, they actually self-insured every single ship that was coming into the Gulf. But when we start having a look at cyber risk, I can already spoof GPS satellites, and last year we managed to put 24 cargo ships at an airport, which probably sounds weird because cargo ships don't, aren't normally at an airport. And if I can take control of your ship, I could crash them into one another, I can ransom you in different ways, I could do all sorts of things. So how do we secure a fully autonomous ship? I'll come to that in a moment. Teleoperators. Now, this is a change of shipping business models. So if you have semi or fully autonomous ships that have huge amounts of bandwidth at low latency, you can now do teleoperations. So you can have a thousand people sitting in a stadium like this or in a local office block, all controlling and monitoring different ship operations. So it's a new business opportunity, 
and it's already starting to emerge. Um, it's emerging in the transportation industry, by the way, that operating model as well, as well as the uh, healthcare industry, because I can actually, from a healthcare industry perspective, just putting this one out there, I could be here and using 5G and teleoperations, I can be doing surgery on someone in Africa in real time. So the concept of tele-X comes to shipping and maritime. Digital twins... So digital twins basically are essentially digital representations of physical ships and things that you can talk to. So using natural language, you can literally talk to a ship and go, how are you feeling today? And the ship can come back going, well, the revolutions per minute basically on the propeller basically seems to be a little bit off. I think basically that the wear on the propeller is actually going to increase, which means that my operating life is going to reduce by about 15%. And they say, well, okay, what's the fix? And the ship can come back and say, well, you can either manually adjust it or I can just apply an artificial intelligence patch basically from the store. What would you like me to do? Apply the patch, off you go. We're already using these in the energy industry. So you can literally talk to ships in new ways once you digitize them. Um, from a security perspective, you know, when we start having a look at trying to secure connected ships, containerized code. So, Containerized code is a type of com compartmentalized code where if someone hacks into one part of your system, they can't jump to another. In addition to that, QKD, quantum key distribution, provided by organizations like SRI. This is coming to the military. It's also coming to fully autonomous cars because they kind of have the same problem. QKD is a type of public key, an encryption key completely unhackable, and it's space-based, courtesy of the Chinese. So quantum key distribution secures your ships. And then when we talk about defending fully and semi-autonomous semi ships, you might want some security, because there are bad people trying to do bad things. Now you can either just control drone swarms, whatever your choice would be. Um, these technologies are already here again today. Now, in terms of future port operations, everything's being digitized. Uh, blockchain, by seeing robo lawyers. So on the one hand, when you have a look at blockchain, organizations like Maersk, for example, are using blockchain to speed up customs uh, because blockchain basically provides a immutable record of what it is you are shipping, basically, but you need regulators to actually embrace blockchain so that you can get through customs faster. And then robo lawyers. Everyone loves contracts. I bet you've got thousands of contracts. Now, robo-lawyers have been used, for example, they get used throughout most industries, but robo-lawyers were used by JP Morgan. So JP Morgan used robo-lawyers, which is a type of artificial intelligence lawyer, to go through all their contracts. And it saved them 465,000 men and women hours compared to traditional lawyers. That's a lot of time saved, that's a lot of money saved. When we have a look at health and safety, artificial intelligence, big data, and CCTV. So courtesy of artificial intelligence and machine vision, I can now watch people at either on the ship or in the dock, and I can tell you loads of things about them. So using these types of technologies, I can use a standard smartphone, and I can have it on a ship. And if someone looks at the camera while they're on a ship, I can tell whether or not they have pancreatic cancer, skin cancer, I can tell if they are depressed, have PTSD, the onset of Alzheimer's. Um, I can tell whether or not they are likely to have a heart attack and all kinds of different things. Um, I can even tell you if they have COVID, because if you talk into a smartphone that has artificial intelligence, when you get COVID, your voice changes. When you have a heart attack, basically your lungs fill up in a slightly different way. When you have pancreatic cancer, you're yellow, your eyes are yellow. Um, when you are depressed, your posture is different all kinds of different things. So we are democratizing and decentralizing primary and secondary healthcare services using nothing more than a camera, a microphone, and a couple of other sensors that everybody has access to. I can also tell whether or not people are suicidal on the dock and if they want to throw themselves off. And you can do this both autonomously and automatically. So when we actually have a look at CCTV, and artificial intelligence, there are some massive health and safety gains, both onshore and offshore. When we have a look at autonomous ports, we saw the first 
fully autonomous port emerging about 2019 over in China. 5G and artificial intelligence, basically our major enablers, basically two fully autonomous ports. But increasingly, from a ports operations perspective, most ports are going to start being electrified because if you electrify something, you actually reduce energy. Well, you reduce uh, carbon load. Drone vehicles, so we've already seen fully autonomous cranes. So, for example, why do we actually still send people up into a crane to do stuff when you can just have them in front of a screen like this in your operating center in Hamburg controlling the same crane in exactly the same way? And again, when we have a look at things like teleoperations, I can show you people in Germany who are using teleoperations technologies to control drone machines like these, etc., to build buildings in South Korea. Teleoperations basically has got a huge amount of benefit, both from a cost perspective, a productivity perspective, but also a business model perspective. And then when we start having a look at hyperloops, so I was over in the UAE when we signed a $50 million, $50 million MOU for the first cargo loops. So on the one hand, hyperloops are, for people that don't know, are trains basically that are in vacuum tubes. Now, on the one hand, this allows you to move containers from the port to somewhere else really quickly at about 700 miles an hour, Mach 1. In about 2025, the Chinese are going to start prototyping a Hyperloop, which does Mach 3. And that's because of magnets. Because no one really pays attention to the future of magnets, but magnets are used in all kinds of different things. Now, from a logistics perspective, this presents opportunities and threats. Because on the one hand, I can move containers out of a port faster than ever before. However, if I have a global Hyperloop network, I can transport goods from China to Hamburg in about eight hours. I can get anywhere in the world with these systems in 14 hours. So I can take a container that's in Shanghai and move it to any point on Earth in 14 hours. And increasingly, it's being called, and this is a long burn. So these, aren't, these are starting to be built, but you're looking at decades for these to really start because it's an infrastructure job. You've got to build the infrastructure. Um, but this enables the speed of flight at the cost. So this allows you to move goods at the speed of flight for the cost of trucking. Now, to bring this back to the shipping industry, DP World are building Hyperloop terminals in India. And everyone's like, well, it's a bit strange because they're a GCC country. Why aren't they just building the first Hyperloop networks there? But if you are DP World, you connect the Hyperloop network that China are looking to build with your Indian Hyperloop, and then you take your Indian Hyperloop, you connect it to your Middle Eastern Hyperloop. Now, all of a sudden, you can move goods from Shanghai via India to the Middle East. That cuts weeks off shipping. And then you ship from the Middle East, or you then have a Hyperloop network from the Middle East to Hamburg. So these, the benefits of these are a lot more than people think. And then finally, just as a bit of a fun one, future of trade. The things that we ship are inevitably going to change. So on average, every single one of us uses about one and a half tons of goods a year, uh, which means that in any given year, we have around 100,000 ships at sea shifting about 11 billion tons worth of goods. Now, as we see the growth of the middle classes, particularly in Asia, that 11 billion tons is going to increase. However, thanks to 3D printing, I know if I'm Adidas or Nike, normally I'd make 100 million pairs of trainers in China. I'd put them into a container, I would ship them to wherever they're going. I don't need to do that any longer. With Adidas, you can go into an Adidas store, design your trainers on a screen, and then they will 3D print them out at the back. Adidas have already scaled these technologies up so they can now 3D mass 3D print a million trainers a year. Three years ago, you couldn't do it. 
So when we have a look at 3D printing, 3D printed fashion, 3D printed sneakers and sports apparel, that's already a thing. We also have 3D printed fully electric, fully autonomous cars, courtesy of companies called Big Rep. Sun setting oil. When you have a look at the oil volumes that we're starting to ship around the world, increasingly that's going to reduce. We already have over 1 trillion watts of renewable energy installed. Food. I can grow food here in Hamburg. I can have a vertical farm. I can grow lettuce, what we call tier three, tier two crops up the road, and I don't have to transport them anywhere. Companies like McDonald's and KFC are already using these different technologies as part of their future food programs. Um, even when we actually have a look at cattle and meat, basically I can grow lab-grown meat basically just up the road. I can take stem cell from a chicken or a cow or a duck or a zebra, put it into a bioreactor, and I can create chicken nuggets, zebra nuggets, whatever you like. And those have already been approved by the American government, as well as Singapore, for, eat, for eating. So, future of agriculture, that's a whole different ball game, but that's just the highlight. And then, last bit of fun, molecular coffee. It costs about three cents to ship the coffee beans that you use to make your, your coffee. There's a company called Atomico. They produce molecular coffee, which apparently is better than Starbucks, but there's no coffee beans. So when we look at shipping, lots is changing. When we have a look at trade and the way that we manufacture goods, that's changing as well. And that's it. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, slightly different view, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, yeah. Matthew. I guess you have covered everything that is going to be discussed later. So that was a great well, opening try. speech. Yeah. So we have some time for questions. There is a question. The micro will come. Yeah. There are a lot of stairs here, so it's not that <laughs> fast. <laughs> thank you for a very inspirational speech. As you say, all these technologies are actually available. They're yeah. being used in other industries. So in, in your view, what is the single most important factor why we are not adopting this more in the maritime industry? Um, so on the one hand, it's that's a very good question. Thank you very much. So on the one hand, it's visibility. Yeah. How many of you actually look at the aerospace industry, the aviation industry, you know, the advanced manufacturing industries? So most industries stay in their own swim lanes. You know, you will look at what's happening in the, in, in the maritime industry, and if these aren't in the maritime industry, you just don't see them. But there's lots going on outside of the maritime industry and everything else, so get out and explore. And then the second, so the second, and then the second answer basically is um, investment. So, you know, I can show you these different technologies. Um, when you have a look, for example, at LNG cargo ships, it's $25 million to retrofit a cargo ship. You know, do you want to spend that? Or do you want to keep that in the bank? And then the other thing is culture. You know, where are the accelerator communities? Where are the labs that you can go and prod and poke all these sorts of things? Because ultimately, with a lot of these technologies, they start in this weird space of, yeah, you know, like NASA's example of, there is no way that you can use a technology to reduce the weight of our lunar rovers by 30%. You're barking. Oh, hang on, you actually have that technology. Oh, hang on, you've actually shown us that technology. Oh, and actually you've made one. So with all these different technologies, they start in this, that's insane, that's stupid, that's crazy space. Then people do them. And people go, well, okay, it's still a bit crazy, but you're not as crazy as we thought. And then they start getting commercialized, and people go, wow, these things are now starting to be here. And then it's like, and then the last challenge is integration. Okay, so for, exa you know, for example, you have these technologies, but how do you actually integrate them into ship design? You know, so I do some work basically with Samsung Maritime, for example, you know, when you're talking about the use of artificial intelligence to design new ships in new ways so that you can break them down easier and they can be more fuel efficient. You know, how does Samsung Maritime uh, as well as Hitachi, how do they incorporate some of these things into their designs? So it's not one thing, it's a lot of things, but generally get out and explore, think about investment, and then think about culture. <laughs> Any other questions?
Hi. Uh, with all this Hyperloop technology yeah. that is like, yeah, you told us it's going to take like years and years yeah. before the infrastructure is here, but we got the kind of middle step with yeah. the electric and autonomous trucks that will be moving from China to, to here, the yeah. landway. How can we compete and how can we be yeah. fast enough to not be obsolete in shipping? Yeah. Thank you for the question. So it's a very, again, very good question. Yeah, how, so how do you compete? Um, so on the one hand, and this is kind of where I step in, because I can show you what's coming today, tomorrow, 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years. So I can give you a point of view. So for example, let's take, for example, the Hyperloop. You know, realistically, the Hyperloop, a, a transcontinental Hyperloop network isn't really going to emerge for about 15 years. And it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take billions of dollars, et cetera, et cetera. And 15 years is probably optimistic. However, by showing you some of these technologies, you get a point of view. And then it's a case of, OK, if we see, say, for example, we take fully autonomous vehicles traveling from China over land, it's the, is it real? Yeah. Who's building it? Who's doing it? Where is the investment? Because when we look at the future, typically we care about three things. What is the future? How is that future going to come to pass? But then the important one from a business perspective is when. Because if I tell you, say, fully autonomous vehicles basically will completely make global shipping networks irrelevant, and it's tomorrow, you care, provided you quantify it. But if I say it's 100 years' time, you don't care. So realistically, when we have a look at transcontinental fully autonomous vehicles, they're probably about, they're probably about seven years away in terms of the first ones, you know, because we're at category, well, we're sort of at, the reason for that is we're at category three. And if you're doing transcontinental autonomous vehicles, uh, you've got regulators that get in the way. So, so we have the technology to go from, say, Shanghai to Hamburg today in a fully autonomous truck. But if the German authorities say, well, you can't, that fully autonomous truck can't be on our roads, it's not allowed. So you've got this, so the technology is the what and the how, but the when comes down to cost, regulation, liability, you know, if it's insurance, you know, how are we going to insure it, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of actually competing, what you have going for you basically is you've got volume, so you can ship volume. There are always going to be goods that are priority, you know, where people want them instantly, and there are going to be goods that people say, I'm willing to wait for a month. Um, but again, you know, when we have a look at the future of moving stuff around the planet, it's multimodal. You know, this is sort of why we have aircraft today. I mean, so putting this one on the table, when we start switching to fully electric aircraft, and Airbus are going hydrogen, for example, that reduces the operating cost of an aircraft by about 50%. So it's going to get a lot cheaper. In the next 10 years, it's going to get a lot cheaper to move freight by air. So that's another competitive pressure. But again, it's getting a point of view, just seeing these things, quantifying them, figuring out, you know, do you care? Are they actually, yeah, when are they coming? What's their cost? And then you put your strategy in place. And with, say, fully autonomous vehicles, it's a case of, well, they're coming. We think that they will start emerging and having an impact on our business in seven to 10 years. Um, this is what our response will be. And you put in a response. And then you maybe take an equity stake in a fully autonomous trucking company. So yeah, there's lots of grades. There was, I guess there was another question. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, this is Marlene Boer from uh, Maritime Sisters and representing Port of Rotterdam. So in the um, future port operations, yeah. you mentioned Maersk applying blockchain technology and that for their customs operations or to speed up the process. Yeah. And it gets particularly interesting, of course, when the regulators adopt the new technologies and when they embrace yeah. it. So now when you look at the developments of future autonomous ports and autonomous shipping, um, I'm really curious to hear what's your take on how these worlds are going to come together and what we need to do to yeah. make it happen. So the first thing to do is bring all the different stakeholders together 
to have conversations like these to put possible futures together. Then try to figure out what future is more likely to happen. You know, so if we have a look at Hamburg, for example, you know, you're starting to, try, starting to trial uh, drones. You know, it's a case of, well, what are they? Why are they interesting? What will they do for us? And you try it, and you have a debate and a discussion, and you find things work, some things don't work. Um, but from a, from a regulatory perspective, regulators, most, most of the people I talk to about emerging technologies and new things that are coming, when you say who should be sitting in that, black, who, who should be sitting in that chair, they always say regulators. Because if the regulators are on board, you could, ha you could have all of the technologies you need today to create a fully autonomous port. And we do have the technologies today. However, if you don't, if you don't have the insurers, the liability people, if you don't have the regulators on board, then you're not going to be able to develop it today. You're going to end up using it five years down the line and the other ports will be more competitive. So this is where the regulators need to sit down and you all need to sit down together in sort of environments like these so the regulator can say, well, what are you doing? And you say, well, we've heard of these things, autonomous ports. This is why we like the technology. This is what we think it could do for us and our industry. And the regulators, and increasingly the regulators are getting the point, say, tell us more about these technologies and systems because we don't know how to regulate them. And then by sitting down together, the regulators, and we do this with the FCA, so the Financial Services Regulator in the UK, we do this through Dubai as well. Um, the regulators are able to stand over your shoulder and say, if you developed an, a fully autonomous port this, we wouldn't allow you to. But if you changed it and did it like this, we'd approve that. So it's, got, it's a multi-stakeholder effort. Does that answer the question? All right. <laughs> yeah. You've got to have chats, but it, they've also got to be frank and open conversations because there is a lot of stuff coming. It's like, for example, I mean, uh, we'll use the crane example. Say, for example, you bought a fully autonomous crane or a teleoperated crane. Who would block that? If the regulators would say, you can't have a teleoperated crane, because we don't know what the risk is, so no one can insure it, and we don't know what the reliability is like, and you know, there are so many unknowns, you can't use it. So you've got to bring everyone in. Okay. So, Matthew, last challenge here on stage. Today's actions for tomorrow's business. Yeah. Three things the industry yeah. need to do immediately. Okay. So, get out your swim lane. There is a huge amount of innovation and things basically that can actually have a material impact basically on your business today. I've shown some of them, but there's lots more. Um, secondly, you need to have a culture basically that fosters creativity, innovation, out the box thinking and open conversations. Because a lot of the things that are starting to come down the line are alien to your industry, but also alien to other industries. And then thirdly, collaborate and so collaboration and investment. Because if you don't collaborate together with other stakeholders like the regulators, like the insurers, like the energy companies, et cetera, et cetera, then it's, there's so many ways to trip up. It's the politics, basically, that will slow you down. Um, and then from an investment perspective, fundamentally, you want to, you want to green the fleet it's what, half a trillion dollars? Someone's got to stump up money. So I work with a huge number of uh, global asset managers. And when you have a look at ESG-related investing, ESG-related investing now accounts for over $34 trillion of investments, which accounts for all of, the, which accounts for a third of all global investments are ESG-related. So that's it. Great. So we have a little present for you that you don't forget us. This Vista Germany yes, thank you flag very much. and a bottle of gin. I need to explain that. Yeah. Well, this is well Franziska's job, but now I'm on stage. So this is a very famous gin in Hamburg. Yeah. It is well produced here, so Hamburg people love it. And this is an limited edition. 
well, branded with Wista and Hapag Lloyd because Hapag Lloyd sponsored um, those gin. So if you have any trouble to take that home, <laughs> potentially, we will take care of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, this is for you. Um, if you can't take it yeah. uh, tonight, then just let us know yeah. so we will send it to you. Thank you very well, much you very for much. your very inspiring yeah. speech. Thank you, everyone. And Cheers. <laughs> So we are now, uh, well, Matthew, c can you just, yeah, exactly. Why, well, he knows what to do. I don't know. <laughs> so we're now going to have a coffee break. Um, so please be back. Let me check um, at 11. The coffee is, well, when you go downstairs around the corner, if you haven't found it yet.